So about 10 years ago, uh, I was in seminary. 2009, we were in seminary. We were uh, students, so we were not rich. We'll just put it that way. Not rich at all. And uh, we needed a new car. Our, our car, we had one car. It was, uh, was it a 97, 1997 Toyota Corolla. Had 100, about 190,000 miles on at the time. It was our only transportation. And so we needed a new car. And so I, I got on, I started looking for a car. And I found a car on Craigslist. A guy had what looked like a really good car. So I went, you know, I, I called him, asked some questions, and went and met him with, with, you know, the amount of money in cash in my pocket that uh, he was asking for. Took, took a friend of mine with me because I knew I didn't want to get beat up or have that stolen. But, but I hadn't purchased, really purchased a car on my own up till that time. So I didn't know all about the titling and all of that stuff. So I looked things over. To my unexperienced eyes, everything looked good. So I pay, I pay this guy the money and I leave and drive the car. And the next day, I go into the registration office. I take the title to the lady. You know, I have to wait probably 30 minutes because you know how that is. But uh, I take the title to the lady at the registration office and she, she looks at it, asks me a few questions. And then, and then she made a statement that made my heart fall into my stomach. She said, sir, there's a problem with this title. In fact, the person who is named here as, as the person you paid the money to had no legal right to sell you the car. And I about died. <laughs> I, I thought, uh-oh, this is really not good. Like, we didn't have, like, just extra money laying around to, like, give away to somebody. And now I have a car, and it's, it's not ours, and uh, we are going to be in big, big trouble here. So, um, all that to say, I trusted this guy, right? What he had done, actually, is he had, he had wanted to buy the car for uh, his mother-in-law, and he said, this is what he told me, he wanted to buy the car for his mother-in-law, and so he had just intended to transfer the title from, from the person he purchased it from right into her name, but then something happened with her and she didn't want the car, and so what he was trying to do was get out, not pay taxes or registration fees. So what he was trying to do is make it look like I was purchasing the car from the, the original guy. So he'd crossed some names out and stuff. Um, but all that to say, like trusting the wrong people can be very costly. Can be very costly. Like that day, it cost me. It cost me like uh, about a heart attack. <laughs> thankfully, thankfully, we were able to get everything straightened out in the end. But for for a few minutes there, like I was in emotional duress, and we were like we were very concerned about this situation, what we were going to do about this car. But trusting the wrong person or the wrong ideas can be very costly. Very costly indeed. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. If, if you have your Bible, do you want to turn with me to uh, the little letter of 1 John again? And it is, it is this book where, uh, about being a child of God. And John, over and over, he uses this language that he loves this, these people. He calls them my beloved. He calls them dear children. And so we come to this interesting little text in 1 John chapter 4 that demonstrates his concern because he knows, he knows that if they trust the wrong people, it will lead them in a bad path. It will be very costly to them in their faith. And so he writes this, this little text right in the middle, right in between these, these two other texts that are focused on love and, and their status as children of God and who they are and what they are to be doing. We got a problem, huh? Yeah, okay, we'll just keep going. So we may not have projection today. This is what we were talking about before. Not, not exactly. But um, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. 1 to 6 is going to be our text. And if you don't have a Bible, on page 1023 of the Pew Bible, it looks like this in front of you. Is, is our text for the morning. And if you don't have a Bible, I'd say to you, hey, pick up that Bible, and you could take it home. We, it would be our gift to you if you will read it this week. Open it up and read it 
this week. So 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, says this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. And I'm going to come through and we're going to, we're going to look at what, what are these spirits that he's talking about and define that in a second. But do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now, and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome that. And I'm going to and have overcome them. I'm going to talk more about that in a few weeks, about this overcoming, but he starts to talk about this more and more as you get to the end of the book. For, and this is the reason, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They, that's these, these, these people, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We, however, are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And John is writing to to these people that he loves, that he desperately wants the best for because he's a spiritual father to them and he loves them. He's writing to them to, to help protect them. Because there's this, this group of people that I talked about a few weeks ago that were a part of them, but then went out from them, and they were spreading confusing ideas about, about the faith, things that would have been confusing for them. And so he wants them to be discerning. And so we're, this morning, we're going to look at this problem that I've already kind of identified, that if we trust the wrong ideas, we trust the wrong people, we trust the wrong things, it can be costly to us. Then we're going to look at what, what does John say about that? What ought we to do? And then we're going to take a little bit of time kind of towards the end, and we're going to apply that to some things that we see, I think, in our culture and in where we live today. So a problem, the solution, and then how that could apply to some things that we see today, because the things that we see today are, are not the same necessarily as what they saw in the first century. So the problem is, is this, that trusting the wrong idea, trusting the wrong idea can be costly. It can be costly. So you see in, in verse one, he says something that here, he says, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. You see that? It's plural. Test the spirits. And then he goes on, for many false prophets, he says many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so we've got to ask ourselves, what in the world is he talking about here? What are these spirits that he's he's talking about? And I think what what he's getting at is that there is a source behind every teaching that we hear. There's, There's something that it is sourced in. And so he wants to help them understand what is the source of the teaching that they are hearing? Because they had these guys and they were confusing them. They would go around and they were possibly saying, hey, yeah, Jesus is great, but you have to know this other, this other set of knowledge if you really want to, to live in the spiritual way. There's this other, other stuff that you have to do. They were adding to the gospel probably. And so John is wanting to help them discern, you know, how, how do we tell which, which people we should listen to or not? He's wanting to help them evaluate the source, and he's saying, I, th- I think he's saying that behind every teaching, there, there is some kind of spirit, and he wants them to discern what kind of spirit it is. And so he gives them really two options we see in the text. In verses 1 and 2, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Whether they are from God. Are they sourced in God? In verse 2, he says, By this you know the spirit 
of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And in verse 6, he says, we are from God. And in, at the end of verse 6, he, he identifies, he identifies this spirit that is from God as the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth. So this is the first source. You have the uh, teaching or ideas that are from God, and they are from the spirit of truth. And so one of the things John wants them to help, help them understand is how they can know whether something is from God that is from the spirit of truth. And we live in a day and a time when there are a lot of ideas out there. There are many ideas flying in our world today. We can access, you know, any, any number of different ideas just, just on our phone or our laptop or however you connect to the internet. There's so many ideas, and so I think this is very pertinent for us today. So the other, the other source that he talks about, though, is, is the opposite. So you've got the from God source, and then you have this other source. In verse 1, he calls them false prophets. He says many false prophets have gone out into the world. In verse 3, he, he identifies these further. He says, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. It's not from God. He goes on in verse 3. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. There we go. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now in the world. So you have, it's, it's the spirit of the false prophets. It's not from God. It's the spirit of the Antichrist. That is that uh, spirit opposed to Christ. And in verse 5, he says it is from the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. And then in verse 6, he calls it something else. He calls it the spirit of error. The spirit of error. So you have these two. You have those, those things that are from God, ideas, teachings, teachers who are from God. And then you have, you have another, another camp that they are not from God. He calls them false prophets. He calls them, they have the spirit of the Antichrist. He says they, they are from the world. And these are the two options. And remember, remember, to go back to the, the point, listening to the wrong source of truth, trusting the wrong people can get you into trouble. That's what John was wanting to preserve them from. And that's, you know, to go back to the car analogy. Could have got me in, in big trouble that day. I don't remember exactly what Rebecca said when I came home. <laughs> I don't remember what she said, but I don't think we were like, you know, oh, it's just going to be fine. We were like, we were kind of freaking out. Because I trusted the wrong guy. So what John, what John is saying to us here, I think, is this. This is the big, like, main takeaway for the morning, is to test, to test every idea. He says to us in verse number one, these are the imperatives here, the commands. He says, beloved, do not believe, that's a command, do not believe every spirit. And then he says, but test the spirits. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Do not believe, but test. And this is what he wants from them. He wants them to test. To test. And that's, that's why it's, it's my hope that, you know, just because I stand up here or some other person stands up here, you don't just take whatever we say to the bank. Now, it would be nice if you... If, uh, if, if you trusted us a little bit, but, but just because I stand up here or somebody else does, I think what the Scripture teaches us is we need, to, we need to thinkingly evaluate what we hear to see whether it's from God or not. 
And in Acts 17, there is a group of people that is commended. It says, it says in Acts 17, the, the Bereans, there's this little town called Berea, and it says that they were more noble than those who were in Thessalonica. And it, why? Because they, they examined the scriptures to see whether the apostles' teaching was actually so. And so that's, that's what John is talking about here. He wants them to test to test all the ideas that are, that are going on in their church, to test the ideas that they hear in the world. He wants them to be critical thinkers because trusting the wrong thing can be very costly. So, so he's going to provide us with a couple, a couple tests. Okay, and these, these are the kind of the how-tos for the morning. In verse 6, he says, We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And who is this us that he's talking about? The us, I think that he's talking about, is himself and the other, the other people who are the apostles. These are the people who are specially entrusted with the gospel to, to take it to, to the ends of the earth by Jesus. And they had, they had uh, teaching that they were to do. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so they spread out and they went all over the world and they were, they were teaching people about Jesus and about his ways. And so I think that in particular is what he's talking about. This is the us. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us, the apostles. Well, we don't have any apostles running around today. They all died about 2,000 years ago. But we do have, what we do have is their writings. We have their writings written down. Every book in the New Testament is associated with one of the apostles. It's somehow connected to one of the direct eyewitnesses of Jesus' life that were uniquely commissioned by him. Our book, 1 John, that we're looking at, it was written by John, probably the, the man described as the disciple that Jesus loved. Most likely, he's the one that was at the foot of the cross, who took care of Mary, Jesus' mother, after Jesus died. So all of the, all of the books that we have have a, a, a good chain of evidence linking them back to one of those apostles. And that's for the New Testament. The Old Testament, you know, that, that was accepted by the apostles, by Jesus, quoted by them extensively. And so we can be confident that that also is the Word of God. So I think, I think how this applies to us is that the, the first test is this. We've got to ask ourselves, is what we're hearing, is it in line with this? Is it in line with what, what we read in the pages of Scripture? Because we believe this, this book is the inspired Word of God, His message to us. And, and is what we're hearing in line with this? If it is, then that's good. If it's not, then we have some conversations to have. But that's the first test. Does it line up? With scripture. The second test that he gives us is, is more specific because, you know, there's, there's groups out there, and I could name some, but, but there's groups out there that give, you know, at least mental assent that they believe that this book is God's word. Some of them might come knock on your doors and want to have a conversation with you and try to get them to come to your group or be part of them. And, and they would say, yeah, the Bible, we have a high view of the Bible. And you look at some of their teachings, and some of their teachings, you know, they would, on the surface, they might sound really good. So he provides a second test for us in verse 2. In verse 2, he says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. This is the second test that he provides. It's more specific. It's more, more uh, pointed doctrinally. It's not quite as broad as all the apostles' teaching, but it gets specifically at who 
Is this teaching, or what are they saying about Jesus, the person of Jesus? What are they saying about the person of Jesus? In particular, it says that every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And there is a lot packed into that name, Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus is, is his human, was his human name, kind of signifies him as, as a human being. Because there, there were some people, and there's been people throughout the ages that say, well, he wasn't really a man. He just looked like a man. He just, you know, people thought he was a man. They were, they were deceived, though. He, he, was, he was really just a spirit. But the name Jesus, and when he says he has come in the flesh, it means he was an actual, actual human being like us that walked the earth. The name Christ has the connotation of his role in his office. Wrapped up in there is his, his Godhead, his Godness. And both of these things are important. Like who he is, he's, a, he's fully man, fully God. And what he, what he was going to do, he, he was going to be the savior of the world. That, that's his messiahship, his Christ, Christness. So the second question I, that, that I wrote is this. Does this teaching, whatever it is, does it affirm the identity of Jesus? as the God-man, as Savior, and as Lord. Because there's, there's many teachings out there that, that would maybe affirm some of these things, but all of these things together are super important. So John says, test every idea, and then he provides us with two tests, uh, a, a broad test, is it line up with God's word? And a more specific test, is it teaching the right things about the person of Christ and about who he is? So we're going to look real briefly, I've got a couple ideas. Uh, this is, I think, the takeaway for the morning, test every idea with God's word. So I've selected two ideas that are very prevalent, I think, in America today. And the first one is materialism. Now, this isn't like materialism, like, hey, just buy more stuff. Stuff will make you happy, though that's, that's an outworking of this. This is the philosophical view of materialism. Materialism is basically the view that there is nothing beyond the natural physical world. That what we can see, touch, taste, smell, what we can measure, that is all that is really true and real. Materialism, incidentally, when, when, when I said at the beginning that trusting the wrong thing can be costly, materialism costs us. We live in a culture that in many ways has bought into the notion of materialism. That there is really no transcendent, supernatural area. Everything is natural, everything is measurable, that, that's where everything is. The cost of materialism, though, is that it, it sucks dignity and meaning out of life. Because here, here's, here's the reality. If we, if we live in only a natural world, then there's no supernatural. There's no life after death. In the scheme of the universe, our sun is going to burn up in the next few million years or billion years. I don't know how long, but it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to burn up. Everything that we have and have ever known and have ever done is, is inconsequential on the timeline of the history of the universe. And our lives have really no meaning. Furthermore, like the, the things that we experience that we treasure, like love, in a materialistic worldview, they are only chemical reactions that are predetermined in our brains. This is the cost of, of materialism. Like, if you take it to its logical conclusions, this is where it takes you. Many, most people in our culture, they, they might espouse this, but they don't want to take it to that conclusion. But that's, that's the conclusion we kind of have to come to if, if that's all that there really is. 
So let's test this idea. Let's test this idea with the two tests that John gives us. He gives us the Word of God, and what does it say about Jesus? In Genesis 1-1, first, first verse in the Bible, you probably know it by heart. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So in the very first, first words of the Bible, there is a claim about the nature of the universe that is, is in direct contradiction to the materialistic worldview. In other words, you can't, you can't hold both the materialistic worldview and the, the biblical worldview because they're in contradiction with one another. Because in the fir- from the first verse to the end, there is the claim that, that in the scriptures that there is a supernatural world. And in fact, the supernatural world gave rise to the natural world. And so the materialistic uh, idea, it fails the first test. And because it fails the first test, it has to fail the second test. Because one of the things that the, the second test, like who is Jesus, it says that Jesus is, is God come in the flesh. And not only is he God come in the flesh, but he's, he's the savior of the world. He's the Lord. He's the one who's going to come and one day judge the living and the dead. But those things don't make sense given a materialistic world. So that's, that's one idea that's out there. And the, the second one kind of has flowed out of it. It is the idea of relativism. There's other words for this, postmodernism. There's, there's other things, but relativism, relativism is the view that ethical truths especially depend on the individuals and societies or groups holding them. This is the idea of relativism. We, we hear it. Whenever, whenever you hear somebody say something like this, well, this, that's your truth, but this is my truth. What's behind this is the idea that truth is, is in, internal to us. We get to define what is true. Truth is what I like. Truth is what is according to my taste. Truth is not something outside of me that is, that is big and cosmic. That's, that's not what truth is. The cost, what's the cost of relativism? On the surface, it seems kind of nice. Like, you can believe what you're going to believe, and I'm going to believe what I'm going to believe, and we're all just going to ha- happily get along. But the end cost is that it opens up society to, to anything and everything. If I get to define truth for myself, and you get to define what is true for yourself, and that person gets to define truth for themselves, the, it, it, I think the end of this is just chaos. Actually, the end of it is, is probably some group of people getting to define what the big T truth is for them. So how does this, how does this fare when we hold it up to the test that John gives us? And you could take any, any other idea. I haven't chosen to put like, like specifically Christian ideas or, or evaluate, you know, other religions or anything. Just, just these, are, these are prevalent ideas, but you could take any idea and you could run it through these filters that John gives us. How does relativism do? Well, Jesus said in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, this is amazing, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, though, though this is a popular thing for us to believe in our culture, like if we're going to hold to the teachings of Jesus, we can't embrace relativism. Jesus doesn't allow us that position because he comes and he says, I am the way and I am the truth. No one comes to the Father except through me. So relativism fails the broad test. Does it, does it line up with Scripture? No, it doesn't line up with Scripture. And it also fails the particular test, the specific test. Because one of the things I said, does it affirm the identity of Jesus as the God-man, the Savior, and the Lord? Relativism says, no, there's no Lord outside of me. I'm the Lord. I get to decide what is right, wrong, and good for me. 
Nobody else gets to, to decide anything for, the, for me. Who, who are you to judge me? And yet Jesus comes and says, no, 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 I'm the truth. And I'm the Lord. I'm the one who at the end is going to, to lay the line across all of humanity and see where they fall. So relativism fails this as well. So friends, there's a lot of ideas out there. There's, there's more ideas we could consider. We could spend all day long probably like evaluating different ideas, but I just wanted to offer us two of the big ones that are in our culture. Because remember, who you trust can be very costly. Who you trust can be very costly. What John wants for his readers, what I think he would want for us is that, that we trust, trust the things that are really true. Avoid paying those costs. On the, because on the, on the car buying thing, to go, to go back, I was able to look up the, the guy who, had, who was kind of at the beginning of the chain of the, the car buying, and I was able to go with him, and we were able to go, go to the courthouse, and he was able to sign a few things, and really it turned to be much ado about nothing. But not every case ends up that well. And John would save us from paying those costs. So let me pray. Father, I pray that you would give us discernment. Lord, I pray that as we live, as we read, as we think, as we listen, Lord, as we embrace different ideas that are, that are all over our culture, Father, that you would uh, give us discerning hearts. Lord, that we would run everything through, through your word. Lord, that we would use it as the measuring line for ultimate truth. Lord, that you would save us from, from following false, uh, false paths. Lord, that we would glorify you. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.